while the slides are coming up, I'll just introduce myself. So I'm a, a mathematician by background. In the last few years, I've gotten really interested in algorithms and society and really uh, data-driven algorithms. So what that really means is machine learning types of things. And I, what I'm going to do, this is actually sort of a two-part talk. The second part will be tomorrow morning. Today, what I want to do is just give you sort of a, a broad, gentle overview of the role that algorithms play in our information ecosystem, because there's a lot to it. And I think what sort of happened is earlier, maybe over 10 years ago, there was this optimism about data, that big data is going to do all these great things, and that algorithms can read your mind and do all these amazing, powerful things. And recently, we've seen a lot of the harms, and there's this growing what some people call tech lash, where we see that actually they're really damaging, and they're destroying society, and you know, electing Donald Trump, and all these other things. So it's kind of hard to know what to feel, and I think a lot of people are either, let's say, working for a tech company and, and say that AI and algorithms are going to fix everything, or somehow outside, and an activist saying that algorithms are ruining everything. And the truth, of course, is both, right? Algorithms are a tool, they have good and um, bad applications. And what I want to kind of discuss is, even within tech companies, they actually do a lot of really important good things, and they do a lot of the negative things. So we just need a slightly finer lens when we're thinking about algorithms. So this part of the talk is stemming from a book that I wrote last year. So if you want to look at more details, you can get into that. Um, what I'll talk about tomorrow is how a little bit of insight into some of these algorithms, like really basic, can actually be just enough to kind of empower you to sort of manipulate the algorithms instead of letting them manipulate you. So that's Today is the overview, and tomorrow is how we can kind of fight back against some of them. OK, so I'm going to kind of conflate the terms algorithms and AI, because nowadays that's pretty much what we're talking about, is data-driven algorithms. OK, so I broke this up into three components, which is creating disinformation, spreading uh, disinformation, and mitigating disinformation. So kind of two bad ones and one good one. So let's go through these in order. And I said, this is just a broad overview, just to get kind of a landscape of, of what's out there. So one role that AI plays in creating disinformation is text generation. The most famous uh, product that you've probably heard of is GPT-3. Of course, there's other similar clones. But it's one of these things where you can type a prompt, and it'll extend it. For instance, you can type in, you can use it like a chat bot, but you can also just type in a headline, and it'll write an article as though there were an article with that headline. So this has many wonderful applications. For instance, my students use this to write essays. They don't have to do any work, so that's great. Um, but of course, the fear in, in disinformation is that people can create fake news. And I just want to caveat it that we haven't seen a lot of that. Maybe it's because it's out there and we're not detecting it. But I think the real reason is kind of economics. It's actually very easy and cheap to create fake news to begin with. You can just type anything. What's challenging is creating stories that go viral. And that's a very human-centered um, concept. So human creativity is still something that artificial intelligence is lacking behind. So yes, they can write these stories, but my 10-year-old nephew could write the kinds of stories that Donald Trump was posting that people believe. Writing these things is not the challenge, but nonetheless, this is a tool that we need to be aware of. I would say my biggest concern with this is not so much that it'll write fake news, because again, we have a limitless supply of that from the 7 billion humans on this planet. What I'm more worried about is that this will kind of make um, more powerful bot accounts on social media. Instead of just auto-tweeting things, they'll be writing replies that look kind of reasonable. They'll be more human-like because they can generate text. OK, so that's one thing that's out there. And within the last year or even the last several months, I have to add another to this list, which is image generation. And it's so close. Um, Meta and Google and all these companies are working on video generation that probably by the time I fly home, there'll be some article that it's out and people are using it and abusing it. So let's just throw that up there already. So mostly it's image now, video will be very soon. Um, you've probably seen all these examples. They've been flooding the internet. A lot of them are really cool. Some are kind of scary. Dolly 2, Stable Diffusion. These things where you type in a text prompt and it creates an image. And of course, someone will use this to create disinformation. If they haven't already, I guarantee it's coming. That doesn't mean it's such a game changer that suddenly we can't believe what we see online, because obviously we couldn't before. And you know, we've always had things like Photoshop, and even there's photo mis disinformation that's over 100 years old. People could edit photos as long as photos have been around. So one thing I also want to emphasize is that algorithms mostly haven't really been a game changer in creating new things. They've just sort of changed the speed and scale and ease and cost of things that people always do. 
So of course, there will be misinformation that's generated by these things, but I'm not sure how much we need to be concerned as much as just aware that this is a tool or this is an, one application, an unfortunate application of this. Another one is deep fakes. This has been talked about for several years, and we haven't seen too much of this. Um, just to kind of separate it from the previous item, I would say this is generating photos. Well, the previous one was that as well, but deep fakes people were generating like profile photos. So there were some cases of a journalist who was writing various articles, and it turned out that journalists didn't exist, and their photo of that looked like a human being was created. It was synthetic. It, it, there was no human with that face. Um, video editing, so creating deep fakes where it looks like someone is saying something that they aren't. There hasn't been much. There was a little, briefly, in the Russia's invasion of Ukraine, there was a deep fake of Zelensky basically saying, Ukraine, we should surrender. And it was so obvious and poorly done. And also, it was such an unwise target. Deep fakes, if they're going to work, it's because something like the politician does it and is behind it. But if you deep fake a prominent person, it's so easy. And what Zelensky did is he just went on social media and said, I didn't say that. So you have to kind of think it's not just the technology that determines how effective these things are. It's how smart the people using them are. If you deep fake someone with a bigger platform than you, they can just rebut it immediately. And that's good. So that means the victims are going to be the people without platforms. So we should be mindful of who's, who's really in jeopardy from these tools. Okay, so that's, that's basically what I want to say for creating misinformation. So text, videos, you know, basically everything we see in here can now be synthetically created. And again, it's not a game changer. It just means we need to be a little bit cautious. What about propagating disinformation? Well, probably the biggest one here is engagement-based social media algorithms. And this is one where, again, people talk about algorithms are harmful. And I think, let's be specific, yes, some of them are. And this is one of the biggest ones that is. Just a story that you've probably everyone here knows is that almost all social media platforms use algorithms to prioritize what you see, whether it's YouTube's recommendation algorithm, Twitter's for you, oh, sorry, TikTok's for you page, Twitter's feed, whatever it's called, Facebook's news feed, Instagram. They all have just billions of pieces of content, and they have to decide what are you, the individual user, going to see at this moment. And obviously, they're not employing a billion people to match and decide. They use an algorithm. So these algorithms have to decide somehow. And the standard thing that basically everyone in social media does for now, maybe 10 years from now it'll be different, but for now is these are data-driven algorithms. And what data do these algorithms have about you? They don't know your happiness. They don't know how truthful statements are. They don't know what's healthy for democracy or for you individually. So just think of it this way. These algorithms use the data they have because that's all they can do. What data do they have? everything that you do online. If it's YouTube, which is owned by Google, they have your Google searches, your Gmail, your history, if you're using Chrome, everything you've done on the web. So on social media, a more specific platform like Facebook, it has everything that you've liked and commented and unshared. In other words, we leave data trails on the internet when we use the internet, either broadly or specific platforms, and that's what these algorithms focus on, because that's the data they have. It would be awesome to have a social media platform that would, uh, mac that would emphasize the posts that maximize your happiness. But we don't know how to read your happiness. I'm sure someone's going to develop an app that you know, scans your face and tries to measure your happiness, and it's going to go wrong. But for now, what they do is they look at what you're clicking like on and what you're commenting on. And that all those kind of reactions and things are called engagement. And these algorithms tend to they preference things with, that get the most engagement. And it turns out that hate speech, incitements to violence, misinformation, a lot of bad stuff has engagement. And it's not so surprising. You don't have to be a, a political scientist or sociologist to get it. The, the fact is the world is kind of boring. Most real news is not so exciting, whereas you can just easily make up stuff that's way more engaging. Right? I could say there was a plane crash and Joe Biden died yesterday. If you saw a headline like that, you would click it, right? Or as I said, Joe Biden flew somewhere and he's fine, nothing happened, nobody's going to click it. So it's not that fake news is somehow more, better or more interesting or exciting or draws more engagement. It's that what true news is confined to reality, whereas fake news, you can use your imagination. And people do. So just this is to say that engagement is not necessarily bad. Algorithms that emphasize is not necessarily bad. But let's be real, bad things do tend to draw more engagement, and that's very problematic. 
Okay, um, this is very similar, but video recommendation systems, so YouTube and TikTok, they're also looking at engagement. TikTok, for instance, did you watch the entire video or how much? Did you like it? Uh, same thing for YouTube, they track watch times. Videos that get more watch times, more views, these get recommended. And again, this just means the things that we see are not necessarily the healthiest or the best, they're the things that we provide data signals to the computers that say we, we enjoy this. The way I like to think about it is, um, so I, I actually don't do TikTok much, but I've done you know, plenty of YouTube, and I've, I'll be honest and completely frank here with a room full of strangers, not everything I watch on YouTube is what I feel like I should be watching. So very often I'll click a video that I probably shouldn't, and it's trashy and embarrassing. And guess what? No one's around, no one's watching, but the algorithm knows I did it, and the algorithm will learn and start recommending and providing me more content. So just be careful. You may have in your head what kind of content you want, but the algorithm doesn't know what's in your head. It knows what you're doing. So if what you're doing doesn't live up to your own standards, you're going to get a lot more of that. And you know, we're, nobody's immune to that, and that just happens. So when I talk about these algorithms, you don't have to know machine learning or anything. This is just like the very basic thing that um, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, these things look at likes and comments and shares, because that's the data they have. YouTube and TikTok look at views. That's the data they have. So if you just, even if you don't know anything about computers and algorithms, just think, what data does this algorithm have, and what is it prioritizing? And that's what we're going to see. And that explains a lot of the, the horrible stuff that is happening with social media and the internet. Search engines, uh, this is an interesting one because it's a little bit different. There's not so much an engagement, but there is a component to that. How does Google know what results it should provide when we search for things? Well, in the old days, in earlier Google, it would just basically do this mathematical calculation of looking at which websites had the most links. And it would sort of weight the links by how many links those sites received. So if a website is being linked to a lot, it becomes important and higher up in the Google search. It turned out that was gamed, and a lot of, you know, if someone writes some conspiracy blog post, and then a, a Fox News um, anchor mentions it, and tons of people write articles inside it, it'll shoot way up in the ranks, even if it's completely made up. So around 2016, with uh, Donald Trump, Trump getting elected in the US, uh, Google was suddenly under a lot of public pressure to do better, because they had a lot of fake news rising the ranks. And the problem is, when you search for things, it's so easy just to assume that what comes up is true. And it's not. What comes up is whatever the algorithm is prioritizing, just like on social media. So Google's actually made great strides. I kind of fall in the tech critic category of things. Um, but I would say Google's made great strides, and they've done much better. And it's because rather than just using the math of links and kind of abstract stuff and numbers, they actually have humans that go and say, these, there are certain news sites that are more reliable than others, and we need to prioritize these. So we can't see Google's algorithm. We can't impact it but they have improved it tremendously. But I think it's amazing that the way they did that is by stepping away from kind of abstract math and data and just actually saying, hey, let's talk, get a panel of journalists to tell us what news sites should show up higher than others. What about funding? I forgot, this is another little component that gets overlooked. Um, when you go to Google and you search for something like bicycles, you're gonna see a whole bunch of ads for bicycles at the top. It feels like that's what advertising means in the context of Google, but there's actually something else that's happening, which is if you go to any website that displays ads, even something like New York Times, there's ads there. How did those ads get there? There are some sites, but very few, where it's kind of like a, a boardroom negotiation where the, the site goes and shakes hands with an advertiser and says, let's cooperate. That's not how most of the world works, because it's the internet. We have algorithms. So what happens is, if you're a site, let's say you write a popular blog or something and it's drawing a lot of traffic, you want to monetize. You don't have the time to go and find individual advertisers. You go to Google and you say, Google, I want to monetize. Provide, I have a, a website and pay me to bring advertise, advertisements on it. Meanwhile, if you're an advertiser, you have an ad, you don't want to have to go to find individual sites to display it on. You just go to Google and you say, Google, find some blogs and, and sites to host my ad. So Google uses algorithms to kind of negotiate these au auctions as an intermediary. It finds people who want to display ads and people who want to host ads, and it puts them together. And Google has various policies. Like it, doesn't, it actually prohibits certain kinds of misinformation, not all, but like health misinformation during a pandemic, climate change misinformation was added a year ago. It says we will not monetize that kind of misinformation. We'll, we will not place ads on it. Well, how does Google do, enforce that when it's dealing with billions of these online transactions every day? Algorithms. So this is one where the algorithm is 
you know, it's not good or bad, it's just it's the thing that's underlying what's going on. So they try to use algorithms to figure out which sites have this kind of misinformation so they can try to defund them. The algorithms invariably end up failing in many cases, lots of funding goes through. So if we can improve those algorithms or find a better system, we could pull some of the money away from the misinformation. OK, and the last category here is detecting and limiting disinformation. So one I already mentioned, which is this is not a hypothetical thing of we could do this. This is now in the world we live. Algorithms do are used to elevate reliable sources in searches and in social media. Facebook does try to um, reduce the amount of misinformation and hate speech and incitements to violence you see. It's not perfect. They fail quite miserably, I would say. But they actually do a great job of, well, I should say a great job. They do a better job of lowering it in your rankings. In fact, there's some interesting details. It uh, turns out um, from the, the leaked files from a year ago, the, the Facebook whistleblower, we know that something like 95% of the hate speech on Facebook does not get taken down by algorithms or people or anything. It's up there and it stays. And Facebook has not really been able to improve that, that statistic. What they have improved is what they call the prevalence. And that's basically the fraction of posts you see on Facebook that are hate speech. That they've been able to, to bring down quite significantly over the last couple of years. How do you reconcile those two things? They're not taking down more hate speech, but they are getting you to see less hate speech. That's because they've gone to great efforts to adjust their newsfeed ranking algorithm to demote hate speech and misinformation in the newsfeed. And part of it is because the algorithm doesn't, it never knows for sure what's true, what's not, what's hate speech, what's violence or anything. It's not sure, but it has some guess. And what they do is, if it thinks it's likely that something is, let's say, some kind of policy violation, it pushes it quite far down in the newsfeed. If it thinks there's a chance, but it's not sure, it pushes it down a little bit. So they can play this game of elevating or sinking things, which is somehow more comfortable than just outright censoring of saying, I'm going to leave it up or take it down, which tends to bother a lot of users. OK, another interesting one that's not so obvious, and this, I think, is a great application of algorithms. So when we're in the, this tech lash mode of saying algorithms are messing things up, remember, they help us in many ways, is prioritizing moderation cues. A lot of social media, most social media platforms now um, have some policy to try to remove at least some types of misinformation. And the way it tends to be done is there's a first pass of algorithms that try to do it automatically, but they tend to not be overly strict because it's um, dangerous or people get upset when their posts get taken down erroneously. So they keep that pass kind of mild, and then there's content that's on there, and users flag it. So if you're on social media and you see some posts that you know, seems inappropriate, you can flag it. And it gets sent to a queue of mostly human moderators that are supposed to decide should it stay up or go down. But obviously, there's going to be more posts flagged than moderators will ever be able to get to. So several years ago, it used to just be sort of first come, first serve. Whatever order the flag posts come in, that's when they get dealt with. And look, thankfully, all the big tech companies realize there's a better way to do this. You can use algorithms to try to prioritize. If, for instance, some posts are about um, an upcoming election that's right around the corner, those will get skyrocketed through in the moderation queue. If things seem like they're more important, more likely to cause harm, like actual real-world violence and harm, if they're um, just sort of more salient and seem like they're more higher priority, algorithms will automatically try to lift those up so the humans see them sooner. So the algorithms are helping in that capacity. Of course, I could say the algorithms behind the newsfeed were also harming by amplifying that viral stuff in the first place. So it's kind of algorithms fighting algorithms, and that's the world we live in. Another one to keep in mind is blocking bot accounts. Uh, several years ago, Twitter released a figure, and something like millions of bot accounts are blocked and, and deleted from Twitter automatically every single week, which makes me think, if we just sort of got rid of those algorithms and didn't use AI and machine learning for that, just imagine how much worse we'd be flooded with spam and bot accounts and all these kinds of things. So yes, the algorithms are amplifying a lot of problems, but they're also kind of mitigating and damping some of other ones. And here's an interesting one, which is AI fact-checking. Some people claim that AI can fact-check or that it will one day fact-check. Often tech executives and futurists and things make these claims. Others say, you know, it doesn't work or it never will work. Um, I'm of the opinion that it will never work, but it can and already does assist people in expedite fact-checking. So the way I like to think about it in simple terms is, no, 
I'll just go on a limb and give you my opinion. No, AI will never be able to look at a statement and know if it's true or false. The world is too complex. Truth and falsity are too murky. Let's just give up on that dream. It'll never happen. But what it can do is various things that'll expedite human fact checkers' jobs. So for instance, maybe there's a whole bunch of variants of the same fundamental claim going around on some social media post. You know, people saying drinking bleach will cure COVID, but they might use slightly different words and slightly different images and things. And instead of having to have a human check each individual post and manifestation of that claim, the algorithms can kind of cluster them and say, these are all basically variants of the same claim. A human will check that one claim, and then the algorithm will kind of apply the label. So they're helping us deal with the scale of the internet. Um, in fact, let me just emphasize, that's kind of the main point is, again, we, we have these strong feelings, good and bad, about algorithms. And my overall perspective is, what happened is the internet connected us. And we're used to living in societies you know, that are like the size of this room, maybe 100 people, not 7 billion. Interacting with 7 billion people on a daily basis is just an inconceivable nightmare. And that's the world we live in. We use algorithms to sort us into kind of little chambers and to, to kind of mitigate the, the vast expanse of the internet. That's just kind of inevitable, right? If you think of the scale, there's basically no other way than to use algorithms to sort of sort our social interactions, our information, and everything. Maybe there are other ways, but this is, this is what we're doing now. So it's not that algorithms are good or bad. It's that the internet has created an unimaginable scale that we've never previously conceived of, and the algorithms are a way of kind of sorting things. And you have to be very careful when you sort, because you create a lot of problems. All right, I think, oh yeah, the very last item I want to mention is, uh, what about detecting this kind of, the created stuff? Maybe, is my answer. Um, people try to build AI that will detect AI-generated text, AI-generated videos. Um, it sort of kind of works sometimes, then it doesn't. What happens is it's always an arms race. Whatever algorithm people have for, let's say, making deep fake videos, someone will f create an AI algorithm that's maybe like 80% accurate in detecting those. But within the next six months or year, someone will have a slightly better algorithm for creating them. And then you have to wait till someone has a better algorithm for detecting them. So there's never a win where like, we can just detect this stuff. You just have to be vigilant. But it, it also means that these things aren't just perpetually hopeless. It means there's this vigilance that for all the weaponized uses of AI, people have to continually exert resources and efforts to build a, um, algorithmic defenses against them. We'll never win, but we have to not stop trying. All right, that's it. Thank you.